Welcome to Who's Curating Who. My name is Rogaya Sek. I'm a program maker at Sabali, and I organized this event together with my colleague Jelle Baars and the Cobra Museum of Modern Art, uh, and as part of the Black Achievement Month. In response to the exhibition Cosmogonies in the Cobra Mu Museum, we would like to talk about contemporary art from the African continent and the representation of it here in Europe. The exhibition Cosmogonies is a selection of the collection of the Sinsu Foundation of the Beninese French Sinsu family, including pieces from Samuel Fosso, Ibrahim Mahama, and Sanela Muholi. Home to over a thousand works, this collection is regularly presented uh, at the Museum Sinsu in Ueda in Benin. Uh, I want to start this, ev uh, this evening, this afternoon, uh, by inviting the founder and president of the Sinsu Foundation. Um, she's an art historian uh, who comes from a family of Beninese politicians and intellectuals. A warm welcome to Marie Cecile Sinsu. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Um, the foundation was uh, founded in 2005. Yeah. Uh, can you take us back? How did it start? It started with, uh, with a visit in Dusseldorf. Uh, in Dusseldorf, there was an exhibition in 2003 or 2004 called Africa Remix, um, where uh, many artists from the continent were presented. And going back to Benin, there was a feeling that it was weird to have to go to Germany to see contemporary creation from the continent mm -hmm. and not be able to see it anywhere around uh, our countries. Mm -hmm. And from north to south, it was, there, was, there were no spaces. And, and so it started with this idea that we had a young generation uh, that had to build itself and reinvent itself uh, because we are countries uh, in the Western African region who have been independent since uh, 1960, mostly. Benin. Yeah, Benin, but all the countries around uh, mostly have been independent since 1960. So we are very new countries, being very old countries and very new countries. And with a very specific history, with um, uh, having our history erased by colonization uh, during mm -hmm. um, 60, 80 years, 100 years, depending on the countries. And so... We have here, in 2005, a young generation that needs to build itself, to create its future, and the question is, who are we? And one of the answers was, um, let's create a space for artists to help us build this idea of who we are. And how did you, um, because we are watching, we can see um, photos of uh, the museum in Ueda. Did it start with the museum? Or was there something before the museum? Did it start with art? No, it didn't start with the museum. It started with an empty space that was 800 square meters. And the idea was like, okay, we've seen Africa Remix. It's really big. It's like on 3,000 square meters. How do we find a big space to show uh, great exhibitions? And so it started, weirdly enough, it started with a the space. Then we found some money. Then we found uh, Romuald Azoumé, who wanted to mm -hmm. exhibit in his country because I had seen his work in lots of institutions uh, around the world. And I wanted to be able to show him to the people around in Benin because mm -hmm. no, mostly no one had seen his work once in the French Institute, which was the only exhibition space uh, at the time. Um, so it started like this because I was 21. I didn't come from a family uh, of curators or museum directors. Or, so I came from a family with uh, professors, doctors, bankers, so people who had not really an idea of how do we build museums. So first it was an exhibition space, and then um, a few years later it became a museum. And... Um were there a lot of visitors at the beginning? The first day there was no one, and the second day there was no one, and the third day there was like three children from the school next door, <laughs> and then they really liked it. We tried to convince them because, you know, it's spending the two first days with no one, it was a bit difficult. Uh, we were telling people, come, we have like free air conditioning, and uh, <laughs> people entered and said, okay, it's nice, but it's empty. Like, no, it's not empty, we have things on the wall, and people were like, Okay, weird person, bye. <laughs> and so it was a bit difficult for like the three, four first days. And then um, the children told their friends at school, it's really great, you can do whatever you want. People tell you stories and they tell you about like masks, about paintings and about stories of, 
of uh, Porto Novo. And, and so the children came. And then at the end of the week, we had like uh, 600 uh, person would come. And then, and then people started to come a lot. Children came a lot. Then we went to see the school teachers to say, you know, we could relate to your school programs. And then the parents came saying, why do our children come here? What do they do? And so finally, everyone came. <laughs> so how, what, what will you see when we will walk into the museum today? In the museum today, you have a, 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 um, a part of the collection uh, because we, we just had a solo show from uh, Aisha Snusi, an artist from uh, Tunisia, who's an exceptional artist who's been very important in the history of the foundation. And today we have the collection, so another part. We lent here uh, in Amsterdam uh, 137 works to the Cobra Museum mm -hmm. um, in an exhibition that has been designed by the French team of uh, Montpellier of the MoCo. And in the Wida Museum, you have a, a collection, uh, part of the collection presented under the, um, uh, not under, sorry, around uh, the painting of Cyprien to Kudagba called Aziza, who's the god. Uh, um, it's a character you will see in the Cobra Museum exhibition. It's a man with a um, uh, tree head. And it's a god of inspiration. And it's the one who makes the artist the mediator between um, what, you can see, what you can see and what you can't see, between the living and the dead, between the visible and the invisible. And that's uh, the way the collection is shown with uh, very young artists, um, uh, very talented ones, uh, from, uh, from the, mostly from the collection and photographers, painters, and uh, it goes from uh, Cyprien Tokudagba, a very classical Beninese artist, to Jérémy de Mester or Dominique Zingpe, a uh, French and Beninese artist. Uh, so. mm -hmm. We also ask everyone to bring something to show, uh, to not only have a theoretical uh, discussion, but also indulge ourselves in uh, art from the African continent. And you wanted to uh, show some pieces of Ishola Akpo, Maybe we can take a look. What do we see? Why, want, why do you want to show this? Yeah, it's, an, it's an important series because Ishala Akpo is, um, is a photographer from Benin. Uh, is the first photographer, is the first artist from Benin who asked us a residence, which seemed weird because usually it's mostly artists from like South Africa, mm -hmm. Nigeria, France, uh, Belgium, who ask us residence. And uh, we said, you know, you already live in Benin, you live almost in the same city as we are, so are you sure we can really bring you something? And he said, no, I really want to work with you. And he came and he decided to work on the archives and... Uh, he was very, um, he was astonished by the fact that he visited uh, museums in France and Spain and had seen um, paintings of important women figures in the history and uh, women of power. And so he came back questioning uh, himself and us about the, um, uh, how women were important and powerful and why there was no uh, no traces of that in mm -hmm. museums or in our popular, hist uh, popular uh, history. And so he came to work about the Agbara women. Agbara is, uh, means power in Yoruba. And he did this work uh, during his residence uh, for one year. Mm -hmm. And uh, he worked on all the queen, uh, the queen figures that have been erased from the history, mostly by, uh, during the colonial time. And the fact that in Benin we had uh, queens. Uh, we had a queen exactly the same with the same power as a king. She was not the wife of a, mm -hmm. of a king. She was <laughs> the queen. And so he worked on those figures and he created this very contemporary um, a series of uh, photographs. And, uh, and in the Moku, in, in the, sorry, in the Cobra Museum, yes. you will see the work he's done on archives, taking very famous pictures yeah. uh, of colonial uh, archives and replacing uh, the figures of male power by women. Great, thanks. Um, I want to uh, invite Emo de Medeiros uh, on stage. He's behind me, a Beninese French artist that lives and works in Cotonou and in Paris. He works in an interdisciplinary way, uh, including drawing, sculptures, text, video, performances, electronic music, installations, and much more. Uh, his practice hinges on a concept that he calls contexture. Yes. So, Emo, what is con contexture? <clears throat> um, to put things simply, um, Europe has been um, mostly using the concept of structure, which is uh, from the, the Latin root stare, which is, means standing. And contexture is the idea of considering an um, ensemble of things, a group of things, and uh, 
under the perspective of their interrelations. So you can talk about the contexture of a, of a book, of an opera, of any piece of art, essentially. So the idea, what, what interests me is to, uh, um, how could I phrase it? Uh, um, like, I would say it's a network-oriented uh, perspective on art. And uh, can you also show us something? Actually, so, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Yela, uh, we could, uh, I edited the video, so now it's rendered. Yeah, you so just run out of the, oh, it starts. Oh, uh, yeah. Is it possible to lower the lights a little bit? Can we lower the lights? <laughs> so what did we see? Uh, um, it's an uh, it's a it's an edit from a video, and it's a um, it's a project that was developed for uh, the Centre Pompidou in 2019 for an exhibition, and it's called Hundred City. So um, um, the very first image uh, you've seen, uh, probably Marie Cecile uh, recognized it, is Cotonou from a, a drone view, and so it's a it's a much larger uh, installation. There are like uh, 256 videos, and video bits, and uh, I filmed it in Benin, Nigeria, um, uh, China, uh, Brazil, and uh, Dar es Salaam is in Tanzania. And so my idea was to sort of um, uh, materialize and, and, and uh, investigate, <coughs> maybe I should, yeah. So my idea was to in invest, investigate the idea of uh, the digital revolution in the global south, and in particular in Africa. So, uh, so it was uh, for me the occasion to, um, to I mean, to, to so it's called Hundred City. Of course, it's a pun, mm. but uh, it's, it's it was a, the idea that 
what is perceived as being very immaterial, you hear about a lot of times about the dematerialization through a digital world, is actually completely tangible and digital, digital coming from digit, which is finger. And, oh, um, I never knew. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that was the idea that it's highly material and it's becoming more and more like an appendix, like a supplementary member or so. And um, I want to quote you. Uh, people outside Africa have absolutely, absolutely no idea about Africa. I can now observe a real movement on this continent. I rarely talk about Africa, preferring to talk specifically about the countries, countries and cities. But there's something happening on this continent from north to south and from east to west, which we are trying to express in this collection. What do you see? What, what is happening? No, it's, I think you, you, you misquoted. I think it's Marie-Cécile's uh, quote. Yeah. 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 I Sorry. thought it was also, you're referring to my quote. I thought, oh, I, I can remember. Did I say that. something like that? <laughs> you want me to explain that? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's just that. It's a feeling I have when I'm in Europe um, that people don't know uh, the African continent. Mm -hmm. so they live on a very 19th century image, uh, and uh, that is Thanks. when you are when you have history lesson. I wouldn't speak about the Netherlands because I'm not sure of the history programs and everything. But in France, uh, you tend to learn Africa while um, uh, drawing geography maps. And then after, you learn about slavery quickly, about colonization quite quickly, because it comes at the end of the year. And usually, you have other things to see uh, before uh, the exams. So actually, you have a very 19th century uh, idea of the African continent. And you don't realize um, uh, that it probably is today one of the center, uh, important centers of the world. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm in Europe, I'm often uh, facing a question and views that are totally from another century that doesn't, uh, that doesn't uh, match my generation. And Can you the give an example of that? Um, it, it's difficult because it's not going to be... Uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to give example without uh, speaking about racist uh, <laughs> comments or things like that, which are often very nice, you know, like friendly racism. Like we have a lot uh, when we present uh, the exhibition and people are, are friendly asking questions that is like, you're not savages, you're not like this, you're not, you know, really you, you're quite modern. Is really and something you, you it's, hear it's nowadays? It's things you hear nowadays, yeah. It's uh, things savages. we're confronted to and no, but you know what I mean? It's like people ask you questions that are not in phase with, with what we are living. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's why the collection, it's not, the, we didn't curate the exhibition, um, but we had to face some question during the creation of the exhibition where we were a bit, um, I don't know what to say, but- Blown away? Yeah, sometimes a bit blown away by the things that would be written or, um, or for example, uh, we spoke about it when we visited the exhibition together. Um, the first uh, room is about, um, where Emo's uh, works are shown, is about um, alphabets and codes. And the first um, explanation on the wall was saying Africa as an oral tradition, but they made symbols to understand each other. And I was like, okay, so <laughs> what do you mean by Africa only has oral tradition? But it was like, you know, in Africa, in people the... speak under the tree and they exchange, but mm -hmm. they never write. Like, excuse me, but yeah, the University of Timbuktu in the 14th century is the most important university in the world. Uh, we didn't keep all the manuscript, but there are still like one million kept today. So what do you mean by we are talking, 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 and then our history is flying away? It's an idea that the colonization decided to impose in the 19th century because we had they had to find justification mm -hmm. to come to Africa and bring some uh, bring their lights to us, but it's not true. And typically, this is something we had to face those questions like Africa is like this, and then um, so that's how we chose the words. And I was like, no, it's very interesting to understand that we have very different codes, but we also have very different alphabets, and we have mm -hmm. very different write, write, written stories because today we are 54 countries, but we used to be thousand kingdoms. Mm -hmm. So we have all our traditions. Maybe some of the some kingdoms didn't write. I, I didn't check at the you know at the mm -hmm. bottom of some Tanzania. Are, some are oral, the, some, some are written. Yeah, but I mean you can't uh, define us uh, as 
having an oral tradition and having our histories that flew away. It's very important. So that's the kind of things, you know, that, that are nice from the people who, who want to explain us or want, want to explain the collection. And they will tell you nicely that, you know, you have oral tradition, but we invented plenty of symbol, which is a very good news. So that's very nicely done, but actually it's just, you know, what I call friendly racism. It's, is there uh, something you recognize? Uh, yes, I mean, it, it, this is authentic. Like uh, three days ago, my older daughter, so uh, I, you have to excuse her, she's not an, even six, but she said, uh, Daddy, when you, were, uh, when you were little, when you were living in Benin, um, did you live in like real houses or you did, did you have houses with thatches, etc.? So uh, the way she's cooled, uh, I mean, the perception she has of ha Africa, she's, she grew up in Paris. I mean, she's been, of course, to Cotonou uh, is this. But, but uh, what Marissa said, said about the old tradition is kind of interesting to me because the thing is yeah, there was um i mean the, the classical history of philosophy in europe you know they have this uh, socrates as being the first sort of a seminal philosopher and one, one thing that's pretty important about socrates is that he didn't want to write anything so his student plato uh, decided to write with the first philosophical writer that's considered as the greatest philosopher, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, I think this attitude of Socrates was about what is lost in writing. So it's not about not only there is an African. I mean, obviously, like in Adinkra alphabet was, I mean, invented like in the 19th mm -hmm. century. So there were a lot of alphabets. I mean, and if and and that's if you don't take into consideration, you know, the Egyptian hieroglyphs, etc. But the idea that of course there are written languages and of course there is but the fact is orality shouldn't be seen as uh, I could say a previous stage of mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 something that's inherently different and that transfers and transmits other things and that's why for instance some uh, occult traditions are only communicated orally not only because they need to be kept secret mm -hmm. but also because what is happening with the human word and the vibration or whatever you I mean the the, the actual the physical phenomenon of, of speech is different and it's and it's and to some extent it's less convenient to you know uh, to uh, I don't know remember meetings but it's uh, it's more useful to communicate things that are at the at, at the frontier of something that is you know emotional intuition it's 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 just um, something is happening in human speech I mean it would be I mean sizably different if we were not speaking today if we're just texting what we're saying right now <laughs> uh, you would, yeah. you'd agree and um, uh, as an artist um, do you have a kind of audience in mind? Uh, actually, so I, I reviewed the questions. Uh, no. Um, I mean, um, to me, the interest, the main interest of art is like it's, it's global and it's uh, trans-historic, trans-geographic. So I don't have an audience in mind when I create something. I just, you know, create it because I feel like creating it because it's a topic like, for instance, 100 City that interests me or mm -hmm. the pieces like Voodoo Note that uh, uh, you have on, on the picture that is part of the Zinsu collection with this idea of what would a future, futurology would be, mm -hmm. you know, what's the future, which means futurology is generally the extrapolation of, of equations and statistics. But there is a tradition in Nigeria and Benin called Fa or Ifa, which uses shells, cowrie shells. And the idea, if I, I, I thought that if there was a future of futurology, probably would involve Ifa, for instance. The idea is like in Europe, as, as late as you know, 18th century, magnetism or electricity were seen as, were as magical. So I don't see why in 500 years from now, what is perceived as the forces of the invisible mm -hmm. wouldn't be something that we investigate and we actually master, probably not, but at, at least we know and, and know how to use. Yeah, I want to invite, thank you. Um, I want to invite, but I'm searching for, oh here. I want to invite Arthur Kibbelaar on stage. Uh, he's a diplomat of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. Uh, throughout his career, he worked as a diplomat in Madrid, Belgrade, and Bujumbura. And I think I am way more, I think. Uh, alongside his career, he has been involved in various art foundations. He's committed to collecting art and culture in the broadest sense uh, to foster cultural diplomacy. 
And we spoke each other uh, this week at um, the exhibition, at the opening of the exhibition. And you said this, uh, we have to take this um, conversation further um, and that it was important to not, re that it shouldn't be a, a superficial um, conversation. Um, when are you satisfied today? Never. <laughs> That's difficult. I don't think it's about satisfaction. It's mm. more about enhancing the conversation. Um, but maybe because you just presented me as a diplomat, I do think that without art and culture, we cannot interpret any society well. Mm -hmm. So for me, it has been very instrumental to always engage in the art conversation, cultural conversations, and the... I think artists usually tell me more about the country than any political analysis or anything else. And I think that is left out in much of the conversation when we try to understand Africa. Um, usually, from my professional perspective, mm -hmm. we try to read a document, we try to see the figures, economic statistics, but we do not understand the interpretation of the main artists, mm -hmm. who I think usually have a language that is far more compelling than what we do. So that's why I think we need to, and it's everywhere, it's not only between Africa and Europe, I think the complexity of culture is always difficult to grasp, even in the Netherlands, but particularly in Africa, because we have so many stereotypes, because we have, uh, I think, not dealt with our past, and because the education is totally insufficient. Here in the Netherlands. Yes, and in more, I think even in Africa, my experience, I'll be very honest with you, in Africa itself was that there was also a dilemma about what Africa represented or what, in my case, Mali or Burundi uh, represented to itself. So the artist... Uh, what did you notice about that dilemma? That it wasn't always presented, that there was a lack of presentation of uh, valuable artists mm -hmm. that didn't get always the, the platform. The gap that Marie Cecile yes. uh, is trying to... Yeah, but it's not only in infrastructure, it's not only about museum, it's also in cultural sense, how to value what the artist is saying. I think that is something that was not always recognized, acknowledged. I lived in countries where we were emerging from conflict or going through conflict, and I felt that artists sometimes has a much better way of understanding the dynamics in that society. So it's not always about the museums and platforms and galleries, which I think are very important to present it to the public, but I think it's also in daily life. How do we get to know better what is going on in the society you live in? Okay, let's start by um, showing the uh, piece of art that you wanted to bring. Do you want to say something before we go into Luke? Oh. That's another one. Abdullahi yeah. Ulugam. I, I don't know if the image is there. Are we going to see the video? Yeah, for maybe it or? start with uh, introducing... Uh, Abdullahi Ulugam. I think he's one of the most important artists in Mali right now. Um, it's a complex figure, which I think all most of the artists are, which is um, traveling through classic traditions in Mali, through very... Um, present day interpreting of the history. But his main aim was we have very intense discussions because I came in order to, you know, deal about colonialism and slavery. And, you know, from my background, coming from the Caribbean, I wanted to heal that past and mm -hmm. expected African artists maybe also to help me, which he was not interested in. And um, it told me very clearly colonization is something about everywhere in the world. And I'm interested in going deeper into what Africa has to offer. And my uh, story, his, I think, legacy work right now is on Kanko Musa, one of the most famous African or Malian kings who started, was very instrumental in Timbuktu, who made Timbuktu actually the thriving university and place of knowledge and everything. So he is working on documenting, but a lot of documents have been lost. But he is recreating the history of um, Kanko Musa, um, Mansa Musa, he has different names. And I felt it was so intriguing to see him. It's something that's decades he's been working on it, still not finished. 
but he's, and I think the video is showing part of that, of his work. But he has many, he's a multidisciplinary artist, so he also has other forms, not only artworks, I mean paintings, mm -hmm. but he is a filmmaker as well, videos, but I chose a video and some of his artworks. Yeah, let's take a look. Ça fait que cette histoire, elle nous pousse dans l'imagination à comprendre ce passage obscur là, dans l'histoire du, du Mali. Ce passage et ce roi obscur aussi, dont on ne veut pas en parler. C'est toute cette magie qui s'opère. Le Mandé, avant Kankoumoussa, avait des traditions, des formes d'accession au pouvoir, des organisations sociales, euh, des mouvements économiques qui étaient propres au Kankoumoussa, il a transformé ce monde. En conséquence, il ne faut pas qu'on qu attende que ce monde le Mandé applaudisse à Kankoumoussa. De telle façon que je crois que cela, ces grandes transformations apportées à un monde où la connaissance était transmise oralement par des initiés, Kankoumoussa amène une connaissance qui était écrite et transmise de façon ouverte, ce sont des chocs. Et cette nouvelle forme de pouvoir que Kamel Kankoumoussa choque et brise toute une structure traditionnelle. Et c'est cette structure traditionnelle qui va transmettre oralement l'histoire de Kankoumoussa. Donc n'attendez pas à voir dans les traditions orales une bonne figure de Kankoumoussa. C'est très difficile. De telle manière que Kankoumoussa devient un roi obscur. Un roi aux origines obscures. Un roi aux œuvres obscures. Un roi au devenir. Obscur. Ok. C'est aussi un artiste qui est dans votre collection. Non, je ne savais pas son nom. Donc, c'est un bon échange. Well, Arthur was also talking about uh, the theme of decolonisation. Is that something, a theme that is. Um, a big topic in the art world on the African continent? Ah, yes, <laughs> on the African they continent. Yeah, no, I, so I thought you were going to ask me about Benin specifically, and, uh, uh -huh. and um, because it's, um, there is one thing, um, you have a young generation, our public, mm -hmm. um, some of the guys who went, who came to the exhibition mm -hmm. from Benin uh, in Amsterdam, which uh, was very surprising for me. and. They are, uh, so he, this guy and this girl, they were, twen they are 25, and they are part of a generation that says, okay, we know about slavery, we know about colonization, mm -hmm. actually we know our history, which is quite rare. Mm -hmm. uh, can you please leave us uh, mm -hmm. be and uh, invent something else? And I think the decolonization problem is maybe mostly a European uh, problem, a um, European problem and the fact that we, we, we're a globalized world, so the decolonization comes to us. We have a profound uh, decolonization, uh, a, a, no, profound colonization problem, but some people, um, some, a young generation today knows uh, it, our history and wants to go over it. They know it and they want to address the future. They don't want to address the history. Because we are always brought back to slavery, brought back to colonization. And at one point, some the young people, some of them want to, to invent another story. And knowing that and getting away from that. But it's difficult uh, when we have the relationship in Europe because... In one case, we know this history and we want to move on. And in the other case, it's like people don't know their history. So it's like it's... Um, L'histoire est niée. I don't know how you would... Uh, it's, 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 it's denied. Yeah, our history is denied because people don't know about it. Mm -hmm. You see, so we're in this weird point where we have to find... Um, Common language? Yeah. But I, my point is that we cannot miss that step 
in, you know, coming from the Caribbean in the diaspora in the Netherlands, not having dealt with, I think, colonization, slavery. Um, then, and I must admit, when I went to Africa first, I wanted to talk about it, and I couldn't. There wasn't, and I was really appalled by how I saw in Dakar how the memory of the slave ports and stuff like, and, and in Ghana, I felt it wasn't doing justice to the magnitude. Uh, definitely. In what way? Um, it was commercialized. It wasn't really put in a perspective, historical perspective for me. Um, so well, it what was, was a good way to put it in a perspective for you? Well, with and I was there with, uh, let me put it, a Malian friend of mine, Igor Diara, who's very much, he brought me. And then it was totally commercial about um, how many people, and people were laughing, there was like art fairs, and it was like things were selling, and I felt... And you're talking about Ghana now, or... Dakar. Dakar, or Korea? Korea, exactly. Mm -hmm. Korea, I'm talking about Ghana, less because I felt there was a the, the, the strike contrast between the history and the current poverty was there. So for me, it was very con a confrontation to come there and to see. But more important, wasn't only about me, it was like, where was the conversation? Where did we talk? How could we bridge that historical um, part? And for example, talking to Abdullahi, who's, who's also said like, but Arthur, we are worried now about our school system and about surviving and about democracy and about this, that, mm -hmm. and not about your, you know, <laughs> your, your history. But at the same time said, we cannot move on if we haven't dealt. And I felt there was a lack of conversation on, uh, and that's why I think the Black Achievement Month now focusing on Africa is very important because as black people in Europe, we need to have that Um, acknowledgement of what happened to move on. So I'm not saying that it should be the only part, but it should definitely be a step in our, um, and for our identity, and that's what I'm saying, it is important to have that conversation with people from Africa who might criticize me of focusing too much, but mm. we cannot move on without that. What's your opinion on that? Um, I, if I go back historically, uh, I go first with colonization and then with slavery. Uh, colonization is 80 years, okay, on uh, on the history of a continent that's thousands of years old. So, the thing is, um, I I do understand this idea that I mean a lot of structures, even the in the political aspect, are and and the daily life are still in, infused with colonization. I mean, what's interesting in Dakar, I, I was at the Biennale, is exactly what you said. You, are, you have this sort of tourism in Gore, and it's it's a little bit shocking. But this is about slavery. But regarding colonization, I think it's interesting to look at, uh, at it in the perspective of how long it lasted compared to the history of the continent. We are talking about thousands of years on, one, on the one hand and 80 years on the other. So to some extent, you know, as Beninese, uh, I think that focusing exclusively on that is to some point some kind of, it's, a little, it's a little bit regressive in a way. I do understand the, the, the need to have the conversation to heal the trauma in a way, and also to deconstruct a certain number of things that would build at the same time, at that time. So that's one thing. Regarding colonization, I think it's it would be interesting. I mean, I'm all in favor of the decolonization movement, but to me, I prefer to have a post-colonial perspective and not a decolonial perspective. And what's the difference between uh, decolonial and post-colonial? Decolonial is trying to sort of stay on this and try to deconstruct, which is a necessary work. But post-colonial is, what is happening now is like Europe and the dominance. Also, we will have an interesting, I have, I have a piece called Chromatics, where I'm sort of uh, deconstructing the idea of black, of the idea of mm -hmm. black and white. And the and I do think that this uh, keeping those words uh, keeps on uh, reinforcing a hegemonic system. So mm -hmm. so it, in a paradoxical way, it, it, it reinforces what it's supposed to fight. But that's another question. But regarding, you know, the, the, the post-colonial, it's, it's Europe is a continent uh, and there are five continents. Europe has a history. All five continents have a history, meaning this sort of focus on the, you know, on, on, on the, the history of Europe. It's, it's predatory history, which is part of it, is 
let's bring it back to what it is. An interesting, important, like group of society, culture, civilization, and so on. But it's not more than that. It's not less, mm. but not more. So it's, I think it's overblowing the importance of Europe today. That's a post-colonial. Do you, you also me, think that uh, art, that also art from people of color, is about uh, their relation uh, with Europe? I, 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 I find it. Um, non irrelevant to talk about art from people of color yeah. people of color is essentially keeping in place you know mm -hmm. the racist category where there is europeans on one side and all the other on the side mm -hmm. so people of color makes no sense for me you know the idea is that you have people from different countries different ethnicities different cultures but this idea that we, you would leave in place the very basis of racism which is white non whites which is mm -hmm. european non european and And use it as a building, as a stepping stone, mm -hmm. seems almost delirious to me, to be entirely honest. And then to slavery. And what part? Oh, you... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so, seriously. How many hours okay. do we have? How many? Uh, <laughs> you want to, to yeah, make another point? Okay, now okay. to slavery. Now on to slavery. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, we come from Benin. Benin mm -hmm. was a, one of the main providers of slaves, you know, mm -hmm. of enslaved people, of deported people, like millions. Nobody knows. I mean, the, the figure today is still debated by historian, but pretty much everyone agrees that from WIDA, probably around a million people were deported. That's the figures I know. What I'm saying is when I hear the story about you know, slavery, this, the, this whole of relationship is kept alive. It's always presented as Europeans, dominant Europeans, coming to Africa and enslaving Africans. And which, with this frame of mind that is, Europeans were bad, they were superior, and they were, you know, they were behaving badly. No, this is not true. It was, it was a relation that was completely uh, of, of equal. I mean, you had people were selling, you know, this is a crime against humanity, let's be entirely clear about that, but you were, had people, you had a sellers and you had buyers. And no, I mean, the, the, the buyers were not dominating the sellers. I mean, I had an interesting conversation with someone regarding the French and Portuguese forts in uh, so the Museum of History of Ouida, which is very close to the foundation, what used to be the, the, the Portuguese fort. So it's a place of memory like hundreds, maybe thousands of people died there. They were left in the sun so that the weakest people would die before they would be deported. And uh, there was this idea. So I was talking with the guy, this French guy, and he explained to me, yeah, but that was a fort, so which means that, you know, the Europeans were, the white, sorry, the white guys were dominating the black guys. I said, you know, no, the, the fort was, the garnison was around like a hundred people, and the Dahomey kingdom was like a Rome. Every man was a warrior. So you had maybe a hundred thousand people who were, you know, so they were allowed to have a fort. They were not dominating in any way. And the guy, it was terribly difficult for him to understand. And so at the, at the end, I don't like to use black and white. I've seen it's, it's inherently racist terms. So I said, you are white indeed. It's impossible for you to conceive that Africans and Europeans were on an equal foot at some point in time. I'm finished. <laughs> Arthur? Well, what to say? I, I like the fact that you want to deconstruct the history and the terms of the racial notions of history. But I do think we live in a very racialized world today. And I don't want to indulge too much in the definitions. I consider myself black or a person of color um, in order maybe to point out that we still live in a very racist society. And I think we need that in order to be aware of what the dominance and what the structures still are. Even within the black community, of course, there are still a lot of conversations that we didn't have. So I think, with all respect, that you are already uh, way ahead of that discussion. And I like the fact, and this is where I think artists can help us to get out of our obsession of, of, of you know, definitions and color. But we need to deal still in a very racist society in which there's not enough black representation in art world, in uh, whatever system. So in Europe, coming from, a, from for me, a black 
history um, of diaspora, we need to name it. And if we find a different concept and definition, I'm willing to go along. But as long as we don't have it, the language, I want to point out that there is a structural imbalance and that there is a need to address that. Give me another word, give me another language, and I'm with you. But I am not leaving the main issue here. We are not living in a world that is equal. So it is about equality in the essence, and it's about rethinking the future. And I think for rethinking the future, we need a terminology. And, and mm. that terminology um, is not perfect. But do you anyway. think, Marie, uh, Cecile, do you think... I just want to add something. I had this conversation with a 20-year-old. So she's my uh, niece. So she's, uh, I mean, her father is from Benin and uh, mother from France. And she was explaining to me, so we're having this discussion. And I said, you know, when you're referring to Asian people, are you saying yellow? Would, would, would that be a legitimate term for you? Because to me, using black not only keeps in place, I mean, to me, to, in all the language I, languages I know, African languages I know, the color of my you know, jacket is not the color that he used to qualify African people. So when you say, uh, I mean, uh, for me, using black is uh, in making invisible history and geography. So what's wrong with Africans? I mean, when I see you in the street, if I see you in Cotonou, I will assume you're African. Yeah. And, you know, in, in many places, I mean, if I see you, I, I, I mean, I will, I mean, given the fact that I grew up in an environment where everybody has an African phenotype, the thing is, I don't see you as black. I see you as African, like spontaneously. The, the word that comes to my mind is not black. You could be from pretty much every, any, anywhere in Benin. I mean, you, I mean, that's interesting also with the West Indies and the Caribbean. We need an hour, yeah. we need an hour more, but okay. I have to say this. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's not about the color. It is a political construct. Yeah. That's all I wanted to say. And then, Okay, but Marie-Cécile, do you think uh, when Arthur is going to Ueda, to your museum, do you think he's going to... Is there a place for the conversation he would like to have, or is it isn't that a good address for him? I know what I hear is that also we we talk from very different perspective. It's um, you talk from the Caribbean, and we talk from Western Africa, and so it's not it's not the same discussion. I and know. it's we and talked about that that yes. we don't have the language, but and we, we have, need to do it. And That's we have why. the question of the diaspora, and I'm not sure you're part of the diaspora, and I'm not part of the diaspora because we are French in France, Benin is in Benin, and so we are never from the French diaspora in Benin or in the Beninese diaspora in France. And so it's very difficult, and this is one of the things we see in WIDA because um, we have a lot of friends from the Caribbean who came to WIDA and they were very shocked, very shocked because uh, um, the street next to the museum is called Chacha de Souza Street. It's the name of a street like anyone mm -hmm. It's just that Chacha de Souza is a man who sold the most slave in the 19th century. And, 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 and not even as a, as, as a merchant, it, he, when he did it, slavery was already illegal. So he, he was literally a trafficker of human beings. Yeah, yeah. he was both and he invented uh, new departure ways for <laughs> people when it was... Well, so it's, it's the worst person ever, but um, he's a symbol of, um, of some kind of national proudness, if we can say something like that, uh, because... If you keep the idea that in the middle of Wida uh, you have a public space uh, which has its name, that means that people from Wida sold the slaves and were never taken as slaves, which is still a, f a fact of proudness. It's, it's very weird to understand mm -hmm. this mentality. But yeah. So one of the first thing I did with um, one of my best friends who... It's very interesting. He's a, he's a world football champion, so he has like this really big legitimacy in France, in in the rest of the world, and he's coming from uh, Guadeloupe. And the first time he came to Wida, for him it was terrible. He went to the non-return door, um, being practically sure that his ancestors went through that door and did the slave route and went through that door. He comes back and he sees that we are we're celebrating the guy who sold uh, slaves and that, and so. 
The museum is in uh, in an Afro-Brazilian uh, building. For me, it was very important that we shouldn't put the... Um, Wida is a very colonial uh, city in its architecture. For me, it was very important that we were not in a colonial building, but Afro-Brazilian, it's those um, deported uh, person who came back from Brazil when uh, slavery was finished. And they came back with the traditional Brazilian construction uh, methods and uh, architecture. So our museum is this, in this Afro-Brazilian because it's very interesting to think that slavery is not ending with people deported and that's it. No, some people came back. Mm. And the story, this building is important to say that uh, we are not blocked in our history where there is a future always. And having in this heritage building an idea of a vision of the future is very important for me. It's very important that in the middle of the city, I didn't put my museum um, in the economic capital. I put it in this small city uh, next to it because for me, it was important that this city, which is a slavery city, which is a voodoo city, which is a, a city with plenty of history and a humanity history because there is a lot of humanity questions that are solved in WIDA or start in WIDA. So, in this city, I wanted not to be blocked in the history, but have a vision of future. And so that's why I think when you come to see me, which I think you will in, uh, in Ouida, oh. um, I think the museum is a good space uh, to have a conversation because you're not blocked in something either way in a vision. You're in an open vision of the uh, of the uh, of our common history. Look, I had two but, points, very oh, short. Okay. Short know, points. But I do think this conversation has to take place in Europe, much more elaborate mm -hmm. than we mm -hmm. are doing it right now. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it feels like a little bit cramped, and I understand we can't mm -hmm. go into it. But that's one. We need to continue this conversation, mm -hmm. and I hope that Black Achievement Month or others will organize that in the future, more elaborate, because we need artists, and we need this type of confrontation. Yeah. And the second is, I, um, a lot of my DNA actually comes from Benin. So I was really uh, triggered by the fact that we in Curaçao, but also I think people living in Europe, have not made those connections as yet. You know, what kind of connections? This type of connection. Okay. Because I think we need to have that personal uh, pilgrimage to Africa, I had to deconstruct my notion that everyone was talking about slavery and colonialism. And I'm happy that I went to Mali and saw a total other, the thousands years of impressive history, you mm -hmm. understand? And that helped me in order to, to have this conversation in another way. To, so art is about showing the complexity of that conversation. And that's what I think is important. And, uh, and, and I mean to say that I, I no, but yeah, I mean, I, no, 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 I mean to say that I, I do think I have the, the I mean, the, the greatest respect and, you know, uh, esteem for people who survived the trauma, you know, of deportation and slavery. You know, it's always seen as, but I mean, just to imagine what it was. And, you know, just to mean the amplitude, it lasted for centuries and the conditions of living for people who were oppressed, were killed, I mean, imprisoned every day. So, I mean, I mean to say that what I'm saying and my, you know, my, my way of, of seeing things has nothing to do with, you know, negating that. It's just saying that I do believe, like you, that this conversation needs to happen in particular in, in places that are uh, being colonized by the European diaspora. I mean, either the place of birth of the European diaspora, but Australia, the United States, etc. This is European, these are not white countries. These are countries mm -hmm. colonized by the European diaspora. So I do think it's highly necessary. I do think it's highly necessary to, to heal that trauma. I think healing is a key word in what you said. But at the same time, I think that uh, keeping some kind of uh, of mental shackles you know and, and 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 keeping being reduced to this idea to me is is maybe stands in the way of moving forward maybe okay. uh, on behalf of the time i'm going to say thank you for the uh, to be the good <laughs> At the end of the program, we can also answer some questions, maybe, and then we can hear from you again. Now I want to invite uh, Lara Caldi, Gertrude Fletcher, Sorry, and Pascale Obolo. 
Um, on stage here. Pascal Obolo is an artist, film director, researcher and curator. Her current research examines the acquisition policies of museums, relating them to opportunities to uh, decolonize institutional practices. Um, she has roots in Cameroon, but she's today here all the way from Clermont-Ferrand. Uh, at six in the morning. Um, Lara Caldi is a curator and artist. She's a member of the artistic team of Documenta 15. Uh, she has been recently appointed director at the Apple Arts Center uh, and will start in uh, January uh, next year. Um, and uh, Gertrude um, Flentge, sorry, Flentge, uh, is curator, uh, curator, uh, cur cultural practitioner. She's a member of the artistic team of Documenta uh, also, and she was a uh, program manager of the international cultural program of Doon Foundation after having developed the RAIN Artist Initiatives Network at the Rijksacademie van de Beelden en Kunsten. Uh, welcome. Um, Pascale, uh, how, did you, how did you listen to the previous uh, discussion? <laughs> uh. Uh, I was, uh, me, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the, of the colonial movement. And, uh, and I kind think... Of the, uh, the colonial movement? Yes, uh, in, in, in France. And I think that uh, to understand, you know, uh, uh, the history, you must very, uh, you must know your past and the present if you want to construct the, the future. And uh, that's also why I I'm created this uh, art journal called Africada, because uh, it was very important for me to writing my own history, uh, especially because when I saw that uh, the African uh, art classic <coughs> was written by uh, uh, European people, because all the artifacts was in the uh, Occidental Museum, mm -hmm. so... Um, uh, for me, uh, it was very important to, to to defend and also to to write this art history because uh, me I I teach in art school and uh, last last year I teach in, I was teaching in art school in Island of La Réunion and um, you can uh, as a student you can stay maybe five years. And uh, we, they didn't, you know, um, uh, teach um, reunion uh, art history, and the student uh, didn't know uh, the the the, the artist uh, who came from la la reunion, and. Um, it's very, that's why I think that it's very important um, about uh, how to deconstruct and how to rewriting our own story. Mm -hmm. And could you make some changes already um, in the, um, uh, the schools you were teaching? Um, I, I, I have a, I'm, I, I was inviting for one year working on the to do research and also to work from, with the student. And uh, the idea, it was to give her tools to writing our own practice. Mm -hmm. But as a, uh, as a student who are based in the island of uh, La Réunion um, and use her own story to rewriting and, and And I think that um, progress. Yes, yes, but it was very difficult because uh, they don't really know uh, about our story. They don't really know about uh, the colonization. And who is we? Uh, the student. And uh, and and I think that uh, that's why me. I, I think that they have a lot of. Uh, I was a little bit disagree with uh, what. Uh, Emo uh, said, because we have a lot of thinkers, best thinkers, you know, like uh, Valentin Moudimbe, like uh, Achille Bembe. They, they, they give the tools 
to 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 understand and also to to. So for you, it's uh, it's still the time of decolonization. For, for and me, we we before need. Before we go to post-colony. Yes, uh, I think we need to 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 continue to to decolonize many things, decolonize you know the the spirit, thinking, museum. I don't think that we need to decolonize museum because for me, museum is something space of obsolete for me. We must rethinking a new kind of uh, art space who. Uh, for the minority, mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, and that's it. <laughs> um, Gertrude and uh, Lara, we uh, we also invited you because at Documenta 15, uh, you were trying to uh, look at some new ways to um, yeah to have an art festival to rethinking art. Um, can you tell us something about the setup of the festival? Uh, yeah, uh, so Documenta 15 normally it's an, uh, an exhibition that runs 100 days. And uh, Ruan Ruba, an Indonesian arts collective, invited both Lara and me to become part of the artistic team. And when they were invited for Documenta, they uh, invited Documenta actually back um, to become part of the Lumung. And Lumung is the, an Indonesian traditional practice where the village stores the surplus of the harvest in a rice barn and collectively governs the rice barn and also celebrates it. So we took this practice uh, as the practice to build uh, both the exhibition, the festival, as you say, and, uh, and this longer term Lumbung, which is a kind of collaboration between artists and collectives uh, all around the world, uh, as a way to work towards each other's sustainability of artistic practice and economic practice. <laughs> Uh, beyond uh, funders or the arts market or existing institutions. So what we did in short is, uh, is create kind of um, see how we could see this whole curatorial process uh, as a decentralized process. So we built the whole exhibition and also these collaborations uh, through a process of small assemblies, uh, which we call mini majlis. Uh, and bigger assemblies, much less Akbar, um, uh, and also around this collective pot of resources, so not only money, but knowledge, uh, problems, care, and so on. Um, yeah, so as a way to see how this kind of institution could become more useful to artist collectives all around the world, maybe you want to continue there <laughs> on this. Um, yeah, I may, maybe to... to uh, so... So, so since the Lumbung is is um, is a practice more than a theme, uh, I mean we we uh, we were collaborating with artists um, uh, that were practicing very similar um, uh, traditions um, and yeah presence of, of sharing. So this is why we how we came also to work uh, more with collectives and and uh, coll collectivity. Um, and uh, we, we did not work with this uh, logic of commissioning, um, which uh, we see in, in the art world becomes extractive to, to a certain extent uh, f to the artist's practice and community. And uh, so we decided also, to, uh, uh, speaking with the artists, to um, rather that they continue working on what they are working on and find different uh, translations to uh, Castle or to Documenta 15, but that also uh, the, the focus was also very, very much, and this was in the background, so you, you could see the exhibition and maybe... Um, yeah, see it in, to a different extent, but in the in the background of three uh, three years, what was really um, being formed was these relationships uh, through the the majlis uh, or the, this uh, form of assembly, uh, where artists are discussing everything together. So it's also a kind of decentralization of the role of the curator uh, mm -hmm. as well. So so that they are speaking together, they are speaking about how to sustain their practices beyond and how to to share uh, uh, resources. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so it became also a space of uh, kind of uh, solidarities uh, as well. Yeah. Mm. 
were you also at the castle this year? Yes, yes, I was part of the Lombok Radio project mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they invite a different collective all over the world and also people working on the radio. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm a part of Black Collective based in Paris, so we create a, a, a sound uh, narration, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of manifest. Uh, What kind of manifest? It was about, it was about uh, toxicity in the field of art. Uh, toxicity. Yeah, toxicity. It's uh, b because that I think that uh, uh, we we I was very uh, interesting about what uh, uh, Mr. Say about they have no uh, black people, you know working uh, on the museum because when you 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 working to the museum uh, mm -hmm. the the only black people that you see it's a cleaner and the the, the security man and um, and but at the same time uh, uh, i think that after black life matter uh, there are more and more um, uh, European museum. I will spoke only French because I know more uh, of French mm -hmm. museum because I, I work a lot with different uh, 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 French museum. Um, started to invite. Uh, you work with French museum, but you're not going to decolonize them. No, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's impossible to to decolonize a, a French museum. <laughs> We must, uh, you know, uh, reinventing a new a new space. Uh, mm -hmm. to to show our own uh, project mm -hmm. and um, yeah before we going to the new spaces uh, you have in mind uh, documenta was actually also a kind of a new space uh, and when i was reading the newspaper here i saw uh, a lot of controversy about anti-semitism and uh, Um, Palestinian, a pro-Palestinian film that got blocked, uh, banned, and the director who um, stepped out. Uh, what happened in, yeah, what happened in your experience? It, it's a very long story, but um, <laughs> um, it, in January. I mean, we, we had been working on preparing uh, the exhibition. As Gertrude says, it's, it's every five years. Um, so we had been working for um, uh, three years on preparing the, the exhibition. And in January, before it opened, it, it opened in June uh, this year. And in January, after we uh, had uh, announced the uh, names of the artists, uh, there was published... Um, on a blog, on a, on a local uh, castle-based uh, blog, a, an article, um, and it was a blog that, that is written by this one person um, uh, who comes from a um, political party movement called Anti-Deutsch, uh, and it was um, baselessly accusing many of the <coughs> organizers and the artists of uh, anti-Semitism because uh, they were, uh, they had, uh, uh, you know, they had made public um, uh, gestures that they were um, pro-Palestinian. Uh, so it was, um, it was this baseless uh, accusations of, of anti-Semitism uh, and really politically motivated. And this spread uh, through the media Um, uh, and the German uh, media took this uh, and reproduced it uh, in in multiple main uh, you know news uh, um, newspapers without, of course, uh, asking any of the artists nor the organizers nor uh, nor us about uh, about the accusations nor questioning the blogger uh, and uh, their intentions and. Uh, Uh, you know, the, the blogger is a, is a known, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, um, a sexist and, and transphobic uh, guy, and uh, you know, without questioning uh, any of the of the background, and it spread in the bulletins, right, and the in the newspapers, and 
Um, and uh, this, of course, created pressure for the politicians and, and you know, the, the board of, the, of Documenta is made out of uh, the shareholders are uh, also politicians, uh, German politicians. And there came um, more and more uh, pressure uh, and um, um, amounting to, uh, uh, we, we had also organized a conversation, uh, set up a, as a um, uh, forum called uh, We Need to Talk. Um, but um, uh, but yeah, it was too late. It was, it was not too late at oh. all. It was in, in, in May. The problem is that there was a, a, a pressure from uh, as, uh, like the, the Jewish council in uh, Germany saying that this was biased, although it uh, contained different uh, you know, uh, members of the uh, community and represented different uh, views and perspectives on anti-Semitism and racism. Um, and Do you think you, there was anything you could have done uh, differently as a curator? Uh, I don't think, I think we, we all uh, completely re reacted because there were, just to say, just to continue, mm -hmm. this, uh, this, these attacks in the media and the smear, smear campaigns mm -hmm. made uh, artists vulnerable in Kassel. So there came also uh, um, uh, racist attacks, death threats, um, you know, uh, uh, transphobic uh, attacks uh, 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 to the artists in, in Kassel. So they made the artists uh, vulnerable uh, and, uh, and they were also uh, uh, kind of racist in their, in their base uh, as well, uh, the attacks. And I think uh, we tried to engage in many conversations mm -hmm. uh, uh, since uh, January onwards uh, throughout, uh, you know, and after the, the opening. Uh, but it was really made impossible uh, with the hurling of, uh, uh, you know, the, the powerful politicians and media. So we were shocked at how, uh, also, um, uh, you know, how how much of accomplices uh, they were. And it was a complete hijacking of the narrative. Right? We were speaking about Lumbung, sharing of resources, a kind of systems change, and faced with this, uh, with these. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 complete hijacking of the narrative towards a more kind of German uh, centric uh, narrative. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And what 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 does it tell you about um, the inclusion of the art world, Gertrude? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I kind of was surprised, like how how many people in general were saying, like, "Wow, this is all so new." Whereas whatever we were showing. Uh, to the people working there was like existing or old or mm -hmm. long-term practice, no? So yeah, it maybe says something also for us working in the field that we don't see how not inclusive the art world is. But mm -hmm. I think in this case it was also, as Lara was saying, uh, we were proposing a new system. So it's also, besides the political agenda, it's very much this clash of systems of the of the capitalist art scene or and the power hierarchies there being confronted with something uh, around decentralization of power or turning upside down power relationships which yeah i think this was maybe even more threatening mm -hmm. uh, yeah to existing people than uh, inclusion per se but what's your opinion on that uh, i was very impressed and uh, it was a uh for me, it was powerful, you know, to, to see that uh, because it's very ra rare to in this very big event, you know, to invite uh, collective uh, artists who came from the south, and also I know that the documenta they have a lot of you know uh, uh, money, and the way that they, uh, how do you say, uh, the way that they working, and also uh, rethinking, you know the cultural practice, like a collective uh, practice. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, and the, it was possible to, to doing uh, and to explore uh, that in the big institution. I was just, you know, impressed. Because you were I know impressed that by uh, the changes that Documenta, the curatorial team of Documenta made. Or you were impressed by uh, the backlash? No, I don't care about the backlash, mm -hmm. but I was more focused and interesting 
about the way that they try to change the system. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's very difficult to change mm -hmm. the system. For me, I think it's impossible to change the system. Mm -hmm. But when I went to Documenta and I saw, you know, and also uh, uh, the, the difference and uh, the, the uh, and it's what kind of, uh, how do you say, um, espoir? Uh, Hope. Spirit? Hope. Yeah. Hope. Hope. Yes, very, yes. Hopeful. Hope, hopeful for me. And let, let's uh, see some art you wanted to bring from Documenta. Um, I think, are we looking at the nest? Can you tell, tell me something? It's not the art, it's the people. But can you tell me something about it? Uh, yes, I mean, the, the, yeah, this is the, co the collective, but um, they made a work called Return to Sander. Uh, perhaps it, it comes as, a, as, an, as an image. Um, uh, and it was uh, in, um, uh, in the park uh, near uh, Friedrichplatz. Um, uh, and it was an, uh, yeah, an outdoor installation where um, the, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, used clothes and, and fabric. I don't and think we're going to see the image, so people have to look it, search yeah. it up, but please uh, continue. Yeah. Um, so so this, was, um, this was a lot of uh, used clothes and fabrics uh, that, that are usually uh, shipped from Europe uh, to uh, Africa, but particularly in, in the case of the, uh, the, the nest to Nairobi. And, um, uh, you know, they, they basically uh, did some research in, uh, around uh, Kassel and in Germany and found uh, some depots where this uh, material was going to be uh, shipped, where, of course, uh, uh, I think 60% of it ends up in landfills in um, uh, in Nairobi, and um, and they basically kept it in uh, Castle instead, uh, and showed it in uh, as an installation uh, with a video uh, speaking about this. Uh, yeah, I mean maybe. Yeah. It should be yeah. Also, yeah. And also, um, you also talked about made you look. Yeah. Maybe this you is have image. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Made you look is an uh, artist duo from South Africa. Uh, and the project they brought to Kassel is speaking about Bokoni, which is um, one of the first restituted lands to the black people in uh, South Africa. Um, and it questions kind of when it was given back, nothing was really done with the land and there was no, it was kind of laying bare, used here and there, but there was no kind of rebuilding. So. Um, they, they are through oral histories and meetings with the people, they are trying to recreate, uh, relook at the, the, the further history, but also recreate narratives, collective narratives around mm -hmm. the land. Uh, so they've been doing that for quite a while and they found a translation to Kassel, um, uh, translating the oral histories on an installation uh, that, um, yeah, that kind of symbolizes the hills in the land and then also a sound piece. And now that Documenta is finished, they're actually bringing it back uh, to South Africa as well. So this was important to us because our question was um, how to use Documenta for, to experiment with the sustainability of the ecosystem and then uh, also see this as a circular process. So it starts way before Documenta. Documenta is one moment and then mm -hmm. feeds back into the local. So, yeah, that's why I'm yeah. explaining this also. And Pascal, you were also talking about new spaces. Um, um, <laughs> new spaces that we have to create um, and not decolonizing the museum. What kind of spaces are you thinking? I think that we, we need more about a space of refuge, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and also... Uh, space of care and uh, hospitality mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also that's why that uh, I know that in France they have n no more I used to work for La Colonie uh, I was in charge of the programmation and uh, it was a space of uh, uh, it's, it was kind of laboratory and experimentation of many different um, uh, discipline in field of art, but not only. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also, you know, uh, the question of uh, ecologic, 
the question of France Afrique, uh, all this, uh, and also how um, we can transform the the society. And uh, but now uh, they have no space of uh, activism in in in, in France or in Paris. And uh, we, as a collective, the, the, the publication now becomes the, the space of resistance. And also, uh, uh, because when we started this uh, art journal, uh, there are very few uh, museums who want to exhibit uh, uh, African diaspora uh, artists. So uh, the, the publication became also the uh, the space of menstruation, and uh, for each issue we exhibit the content of different uh, spaces, and um, and also it's a space of uh, I think it's em emancipation, and uh, we have a total freedom to do what we want, and uh, that's I think it's uh, also very important and also very rare, and for me I think it's. Uh, uh, we create also the African Art Book Fair that we organize every two years. We are more focused about uh, editorial practice, but mm -hmm. as, as a curating. Um, and the idea also is to support the independent uh, uh, arts publishing based in Africa and create an exchange yeah. between South, of South with South, more than South with North. Uh, when you were at the Biennale of um, Dakar this year, you um, you were interviewed by the New York Times, and you said, I quote, the, the United States and Europe these days seem out of ideas, stuck in social crisis and democratic decline. Um, we have to write our own histories of contemporary art. We can't miss the boat this time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I, I think it's... Uh uh, in the field of art, uh, 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 publication, I, I would say that it's a, it's a poor part. Mm -hmm. I think that it's very difficult to, to find some funding for uh, uh, publication. And um, when I, uh, I participated in many uh, art book fairs, in, uh, in, uh, not only in Europe, in Sarja or in New York. Mm -hmm. And every time, you know, uh, when I participated, I'm only a uh, uh, house publishing uh, who based uh, in uh, and working in the field of uh, African uh, art. And they, it's very difficult to find and some house publishing who came from Africa, participated in African, uh, in a our book fair. But uh, now um, I'm, I'm working now with Miss Reed, and Miss Reed is one of the biggest uh, art book fair based in Berlin. And we started in two years to, uh, to curate it some uh, space to invite an uh, independent publisher from Africa to have more visibility and also to to mm -hmm. to to know more uh, about what uh, think what we thinking and writing in the field of art in in Africa. Yeah, um, I think there are a lot of people who are working in the art world in, in the audience. So I also want to um, to um, there, are, there there's a possibility for questions. I think right now, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Maybe Marie Cecile and uh, Pascal. Who is curating who? <laughs> it's complicated to answer this question because I didn't ask it, and the exhibition that is in the Cobra Museum, I didn't curate it. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but so it's. Um, <clears throat> It's always a difficulty when you when you want to show. We we want to present. Um, we wanted to present um, 
art from the continent and from elsewhere. The collection is not only from African artists, it's from artists. So we wanted to present contemporary art in uh, Western Africa. After 17 years, um, when we were invited by uh, a museum, um, we decided that the collection should travel because it was so important for people to discover that um, who we are. So we wanted people to have an access to the collection and wanted uh, the works uh, we have in Western Africa to have the chance to be seen uh, in the rest of the world. Because often we see, uh, when we travel with my team, we see uh, exceptional works in Europe that nobody will see in Africa. So we didn't want to do the same. We didn't want to keep for us uh, what we had in Western Africa. And it was an excellent opportunity for people to see it. And then the question of curation. We didn't curate. We lent 137 works. Some of them we were very happy to show them. Some of them we were... Um, do you think you could uh, curate an uh, exhibition in the Netherlands? without knowing the, net, the, well, the it, context? It's very difficult for me to answer that question because I absolutely don't... Uh, mm -hmm. No, I haven't thought about it. And, but we have uh, another exhibition that is uh, going to tour uh, and then we will do the curation because it's very important that we present uh, the works and so the work we do and the image we want to project. It's very important, I think, that we have uh, a control on, what we, on how we want to show um, the creation. The question was also to Pascal, I know. But I just wanted to say we're shifting, and I think the political situation right now is shifting that you cannot curate about Africa without Africa. And I think that is something that is um, uh, something that you cannot um, redress anymore. So if you talk about who is curating who, we cannot have teams, and it's still happening, I think. But we should at least now acknowledge, I think, in this audience, that it couldn't be without Africa itself being completely involved. And I think that is a shift that I hope is really materializing, but also in Africa, because it's a, it's a universal question everywhere. It's not only about Africa between Europe, but what I think is the shift in Europe, and hopefully in museums and any festivals, that you cannot curate anything about Africa without Africa. Thanks. Pascal, the question was also to you. Uh, uh, me, I try to curate in thinking. So uh, every time uh, it's uh, um, collaborative uh, uh, curating. And, um, and for me, curating means tell our own story. Are there any other questions from the audience? Okay. Hi, thank you. So, uh, my name is Sofana. I had a question as well for you because you talked about that at Documenta 15 you are no longer centering the curator and that the artists are in their own work, curating their own work. Um, how did they look back on it and did it work out the way you wanted to? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a very long uh, conversation because uh, like uh, then it's about also understanding what curating is, no? and this question of who, who's uh, curating uh, who. It's about the, the narrative, um, and it's about the way that uh, one does it. So, for example, it, you know, it wasn't also, it was portrayed because of this, um, uh, of these uh, media and political attacks on Documenta 15. It was portrayed all the time that, um, or this attack that it was this uncurated uh, uh, exhibition, which was very um, uh, unjust, let's say. It was a different way of curating, right? We, uh, I mean, uh, just to say that Ruan Grupa, the artistic directors, are artists themselves. Uh, we belong to uh, other collectives as well. Uh, so it was from the perspective of the artists, but it was very much uh, curated. So the way that we that we uh, discussed things 
Uh, it was, let's say, collectively curated rather than this power in the hands of the few, right? It was a redistribution of uh, power and resources, uh, uh, the lumbung. We couldn't come with the practice of the lumbung and ask the artists to practice it while we didn't uh, practice it. So it was maybe even overtly curated because there were so many um, people speaking to each other actually about the practices and, and what they're doing and, and the castle ecosystem because, you know, Ruru House, which is uh, two members of Ruan Grupa uh, for two years have been living in uh, Kassel and working with Kassel-based collectives and artists and they were also very much involved in conversations with, uh, with all the artists and us telling us about the context and working together so it was, um, it was a different like a redistribution of the power of the curator uh, let's say yeah a collective curating of, of sorts yeah uh, well, I'm not sure if I can formulate, but it's for Emo and also for you, uh, in a sense that when you say, I think it's very funny when you say, I don't know, I don't do art for uh, the market or not for any public specific or any audience. How do you feel uh, the curatorial procedure as something, or the artist artist making procedure, or if you ever uh, think advantage of Benin as like a poverty pornography? Or how does this work, for example, also in Castle, when most of the audience is Europeans and we are like uh, uh, enjoying or facing the pornography as poverty of the world, as, I don't know, in the 17th century, the cabinet of curiosities with all uh, a representative of Benin, another one from Nairobi, and we are just like uh, as human zoos expecting this uh, pornography, I would say. Oh, I thought as well. <clears throat> uh, regarding the, porno I mean, the pornography of poverty, I'll just take two examples. The first one is uh, one regarding Wida. I made a piece called Caleta Caleta in uh, 2015 that was filmed in the Portuguese fort that I was mentioning uh, a moment ago. And it was about a Beninese Afro-Brazilian tradition that was created in Benin, uh, performed by children, and the idea is it was a place of memory, but the, 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 the message of it was this tradition was born in Wida. So it's not, it wasn't only a place of death, it was also a place where things rebirthed, I mean, from uh, Brazilians coming back, Afro-Brazilians coming back to Wida. And so the idea was like, life prevails. And, and in a way, like the African diaspora, everywhere it was enslaved and oppressed and, I mean, survived. So it's, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, black lives mattered enough and resistance was present enough so that people survive. So that's an important point for me. So I never gave into this pornography of poverty you're mentioning. And as what um, a moment ago was Pascal said about resistance, I mean, the, 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 the a place, I mean, uh, she saw the piece in Paris, it was in 2017, I made a piece called Points of Resistance, and the piece was featuring 128, so it's 226, I mean, it's a digital thing, but 128 excerpts from uh, sound bites, so there were like uh, uh, 64 fists, uh, getting out of the wall. So, and the the place, the space, the piece was inspired by the 1968 Olympic Games, but the the sound bites were from Maya Angelou, from Nelson Mandela, but also from Tiananmen, also the Declaration of Independence of Vietnam, also Lumumba. What I mean is like. Uh, the, the point about resistance is I do think there are different forms of resistance and there is not only one way. And I mean, if the notion of minority exists, uh, then it, it, also must, uh, it also must exist within the African diaspora and within the African community. So the thing is like this, you know, uh, I would say fol folkloric approach that you have, I mean, I won't name anyone, but there are <laughs> African artists who are actually playing on this, like feeding, uh, you know, reinforcing stereotypes, you know, in, in a like Western audience. And I'm very much against that. But the idea is for me the res the, that the resistance has to be um, multiple, multifold, and constant. Thank you. Is there someone else who wants to say something on that question? Maybe just a little bit about the guest and the host, uh, because um, you know I think 
in uh, in Kassel in Documenta 15, uh, many artists, I, I think everyone played with this idea of the gu the guest and the host, right? And and the power structure as well. Uh, everyone was guest, but everyone played host in in artists inviting other artists to um, uh, to to um, be in the exhibition, but also to invite the guests, the 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 audiences to be. In, in the exhibition, part of the exhibition, and 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 take part in it, so that you know, so that you you're not looking from the outside to the inside. You are inside, right? The the Lumbung, the Documenta 15 is could see it in that sense that it's um, it's it's a lot about experience as well. So once you, but you have to be also as audience. The, the, we have to speak also about the responsibility of of the audience uh, as well, right? And that if you are uh, uh, inside, then you cannot look from the outside in, into the, the the inside. And just one last point is that a lot of the collectives uh, uh, and and projects that were i mean really the collectives that that were there were mainly also collectives that have survived and have um, become models of amazing resilience and resistance and and like on how to sustain themselves and how to live and work differently and to sh to really share um, in in uh, uh, in other places in the world as a as a model to learn from actually so I think it was I think I would like to say that they they were all in a position of power where uh, where one could learn from their resilience and inventive uh, uh, ways of 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 you know living otherwise and and practicing otherwise and not the other way around. Thanks. Yeah. One last Can I oh, add some? Oh, okay, yeah. No, just um, because also I think this question of, of how such a platform can become useful then puts them into power to decide. Like I think the two examples we have been talking about are maybe the examples where uh, the artist really felt it was important to them to make like bigger objects in Kassel. But there are other examples like, for example, Chimorenga, I think that many people know. Mm. Uh, that works on uh, liberation movements in Africa through music that have done their projects in, um, in, in different countries in Africa and in Kassel there was only radio even not announced. So that was the most extreme other case maybe whereas Festival Sur le Niger had a big presence but actually used it to create collaborations with the other collectives uh, in the space. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. One last question from the audience before we round up. Um, <coughs> yes. So, um, Arthur, you were saying that um, these conversations are uh, uh, not really. We, we are not really having them here, uh, and like, and we should. We should have them. Um, so, my question is: Why do you think, especially then, maybe in Dutch institutions, uh, are hesitant to uh, have these conversations and? What would be your uh, message to the Dutch art world in this sense? <laughs> <laughs> Big responsibility now. I have some colleagues in the room, so I have to be careful now. Um, what would be my message? Um, why are we not having it? I think it's fear, and I think it's power. Um, power to control, because it's very difficult to let go. and I. Um, interpreting maybe Pascal's words in a different way, but I do think it's very difficult to transform the system that we have. And there's a lot of money and infrastructure behind it. So interests, power, all that, I think, will make it difficult. Why are we not having it? I think it's also part of fear, because we are not used of questioning ourselves. And I do not see in the, and I'm making a very broad institutional, I know, statement, but also for the sake of the conversation maybe, lack of reflection within the institutions to see how the world is changing. And I do think that comes only when you are able to self-reflect on yourself. And it's very difficult. But I do think that is the main cause why we're not progressing. Having said that, I want to make a positive um, ending. The times are changing. 
Black Lives Matter, of course, but I do think also what happening in Africa is so much more powerful if you see it on a more structural point, not if you see the current present day situations, it might be difficult to see. But if you see the demographics in Africa, if you see only the 40, 60 years after colonialism and stuff like that, if you see it from a historical point of view where there are thousands years of, you know, traditions are much stronger, I think things will change and we are undoubtedly seeing another future coming. The question is whether we are ready for it or we let it happen. On that note, I want to thank all the guests here. And um, yeah, I want to say to everyone, check it out, the exhibition in the Cobra Museum. Uh, there are also a lot of programs in the Black Achievement Month here in the Bali, but also in a lot of other venues. And I also want to say, uh, check out Afro Vibes because there are wonderful artists uh, also uh, from different countries in Africa here in the Netherlands. So. Um, thank you for being here and the questions and uh, have a good weekend.